often I'm told that what we do is out of the box. Out of the box. In 2019, that was the last year that we were able to take a team to the Dominican Republic because of the COVID restrictions. Two months before our team arrived there, I was summoned to the palace in Santo Domingo to meet with some government officials in the palace. And God spoke to my heart during that meeting about what he was going to do in us and through us on the trip. And I brace myself, I immerse myself in prayer because, friends, whenever God is about to do something extraordinary, hell always tries to break in just before the breakthrough. And God took me to a little shop down in the old colonial city, and he showed me these boxes. He took my attention to these boxes, the Dominican boxes that that sat on that shelf. And God told me to buy one box for every team member on our team. Then he proceeded to tell me how to instruct our team that year so that we would see his healing, saving power manifested amongst us. I said, God, is that you? And the Holy Spirit reminded me, I mean, you know, buying 270 of these boxes, I wanted to make sure it was God, all right? So God said, yeah, that's that's definitely me. And he took me to the words of Jeremiah recorded for us in Jeremiah 32, verse 17. The word of the Lord had just come to Jeremiah, and he declared in prayer, Ha, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Can you say amen? You see, Believers need to be reminded of Jeremiah's declaration because we have a habit of putting God in a box. And we set up him up on a shelf and only take him down and let him out and call upon him when we get into a situation, a problem, a moment of desperation, and we need God to show up. How many of you remember those times in your life? And we have a habit of putting God in the box when it comes to believing him for the seemingly impossible. My board of directors told me, they said, Pastor Kurt, you need to listen to us and listen to us clearly. You cannot drive that 26-year-old motor coach across the United States anymore. It's got over 400,000 miles on it, and the dealer said it's not roadworthy anymore. You cannot do this. And it's like, How in the world are we going to do it without a motor coach? This is how it happens. And you know what? God sent us a man who came up to us and said, let's go look at him, took us down to the dealership, and we picked out that one. That one would work. And he said, great, I'll pay for it. Yes, yes. So if you give to Hope International, Hope International is not buying stuff like that. That coach was bought for Hope International by one individual. Can you say, that's a miracle. That's letting God out of the box. We use the money to buy medicine and medical supplies to bless the people of that nation. You know what? We have a habit of putting God in a box when it comes to believing him for the seemingly impossible, like that motor coach especially when things that are happening all around us just don't make sense. You look at what's happening in our world today. Nothing seems to make sense. That's when we all have a habit of taking control and trying to fix things ourselves. Do we have any fixers here today? Any of you try to fix it for God? You know, that's what we do, you know. All the time, God just wants us to let him out of the box so he can fix it, and he does such a better job. Well, how do we let him out of the box is the question. First, we need to understand what put him in the box. Don't get mad at me, but we put put him in the box when we put our agenda above his. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah penned these words. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sometimes I think that we think that we know more than God thinks. 
You see, we put our agenda above his when we fight for our political parties' positions and platforms and spend more time doing so than reaching the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. All this political foolishness going on around us has me praying for a revival that will disrupt the 2022 elections in the same way that it did when the famous evangelist Billy Sunday came into a city. You Google him and you'll find out what happened in the cities. When Billy Sunday came into a city and he put that tent up and began to hold revival meetings, bars closed down, prostitution rings split up, Criminals repented and they turned themselves in. Political leaders of the day were on their faces before God, repenting to a holy God. And society as a whole, they listened to what the word of God declared over their nation and their lives. Let me remind us all, friends, that Jesus didn't fill you with his Holy Spirit to be a political witness. He filled you with his spirit to be his witness. Dr. Alex will tell you that when we have our first meeting the first night of our, of, our, of our missions trip in the Dominican Republic, I let our people know that all political discussions are banned on our trip. I do. Because they don't know what's going on in the, in the United States, and they could care less. Those folks are coming to get healing, and we're coming to give them Jesus and to give them healing. Can you say amen? Amen. So our political, I want all of our team, they need to be just no politics. I tell them, if I hear you talking politics, I find out you're talking politics, I pack you up, I take you to the airport, and I send you home right away. Well, that's kind of harsh, Pastor, isn't it? Not really, when you consider the focus that we have to have while we're there in the Dominican Republic. You see, while there is great strength in unity amongst diversity, nothing divides a people quicker than politics, and nothing will hold back the blessings of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the life-saving, miracle-working power of God quicker than a body of believers who are divided and fighting against each other. Politics can't be a part of our mission. You see, friends, Jesus is coming again. I said, Jesus is coming again. I told the first service, if you don't acknowledge me, if you don't respond, I think you didn't hear me. I repeat myself, a half hour message becomes an hour long. (laughs) Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 is still true. For the Lord himself will descend out of heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Jesus is coming again. There's no time to waste, friends. Our priority must be to reach Staten Island, New York, and the world with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me, let me bring this portion to an end. If our interaction with politics causes us to hate, to loathe, to mock, or act uncaringly towards any individual on either side of the aisle, we probably have a little adultery going on there. I checked, I looked in this book again this morning, and that love your enemies thing, it's still in there. You see, the funny thing is, is that oftentimes we look at people because of their positions and we call them enemies. God calls them the mission field. As we look at our society and our world today, clearly we are struggling to regain godly control. And it would do us well to consider the words of Ezra proclaiming the faithfulness of God to a repentant people in Ezra chapter 9, verse 5 through 9. Let me read it to you. This is what it said. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting, says Ezra, 
having torn my garment and my robe. I fell on my knees and I spread out my hands to the Lord, my God, and said, oh my God, I'm too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you. My God, our iniquities has risen higher than our heads and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty for our iniquities We, our kings, our priests, have been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation as it is this day. And now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in the holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. For we were slaves Yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. Friends, I personally witnessed an entire country where the church used the weapons of their warfare that are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's prayer. The church in the Dominican Republic really didn't have any, uh, any political clout, but they knew that they had a weapon of prayer in their arsenal, and they used it. Because the week before our team arrived there in 2019, the government made it law for the Bible to be taught in every classroom and in every school in their entire country. Can you say praise the Lord? You see, friends, Ezra reminds us, let me encourage you as well, take advantage of these days that we are living in today to repent on behalf of our nation who has strayed so far from the biblical foundations from which it was built upon, to maximize your opportunities to reach the lost and the hurting with, for Jesus, to work while it's yet day because the night is coming when no man can work. The church is changing the nation in the Dominican Republic, and I'm just crazy enough to believe that the church can change this nation as well. Be salt. Be salt. Be light as you let your voice be heard in the voting booth. But remember, Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't destroyed because of the wickedness of its king or the ruling party. It was destroyed because of the lack of 10 righteous men to redeem it. Secondly, the wrong attitude will dam up the flow of the rivers of living water in which God desires to saturate our lives in. Wrong attitudes will keep him in the box. In the Dominican Republic, our attitudes need to be focused on the mission of touching every patient with the compassion of Christ. Same is true for us here at Gateway. An attitude that says, well, that's not my job. Or, I I did that before. Or my favorite one that I hear in Florida all the time, I'm retired now. (laughs) Is no bueno. That means no good. I remember my wife and I took a, a group of pastors, three pastors, a translator. My wife and myself went to the Dominican Republic in December to actually do a pastor's conference in Nagua, and it was called Fire in Your Bones Conference. So we got there, and this one pastor, I knew all three of these pastors. I preached for them, but I didn't know them all that well. Well, the one pastor, he's about six foot four. He's a big boy, and we got to this little hotel in the middle of Nagua, and there's not much there to stay in in Nagua, but we went went to this hotel. It was supposed to be one of the nicest there, but it was, had very small rooms, about the size of a walk-in closet. And, and the beds were not king beds like they said. They were like junior twin beds. And so, you know, I took him in and I gave him the room and there's a little air conditioner in the wall, just a little thing, and it only worked when the electricity was on. So, so we get down to dinner in the lobby, three tables, we pulled them together, and that's where we had dinner in the lobby of this restaurant, or this hotel, and uh, it, was a, it was a very limited menu, and, and the big guy starts talking, the big pastor. He says, you know, when I go to Nicaragua or I go to El Salvador, the pastors meet me at the, at the, at the airport, and they carry my luggage. They carry my Bible. 
They take me to a very nice hotel with a large room and air conditioning that works. And then they feed me the kind of food that I'm used to. Steak, lobster, because I'm a pastor. God didn't call me to be a missionary. Now, you guys don't know me, but I can get pretty riled. I, I'm really German. I wanted to be Italian. My, after my father's death, my mom remarried, and she married a guy by the name of Carmelo Galliano, so I am Italian. <laughs> but I'm German, and when I was listening to that, I started feeling like invading Poland. Some of you will get that later. I was like, oh God, keep a watch over my mouth. And I'm saying, God, I, I don't want to mess up my relationship. I don't want to say something I shouldn't. God, help me. And I can get pretty riled. And I was just praying, God, help me not to get pretty riled and, and let that come out my mouth. When all the time I should have been praying for my wife's mouth. <laughs> yeah. Because as soon as he said, well, I'm not a... I'm, I, I'm not a missionary. God called me to be a pastor. And my wife, she slapped the table and she said, well, this year at week, you're a missionary. <laughs> I said, amen, sister, you said it. But one of the reasons why we see miracles happen, we see Pastor Alex will testify, they'll testify, but men, that they, a man came into a clinic one day, he, he hadn't walked in 18 years, and, and, and he, they prayed for him. There's nothing our medical staff could do, they just prayed for him. He got up and started walking, but he didn't have any shoes. Nothing fit him in the gift room, so he took my shoes. And I wear a pair of girls' flip-flops for the rest of the day. True story. He walked home, left the wheelchair with us. He said, give it to somebody who needs it. People came in. A woman, she hadn't, she, born deaf, laid hands on her, and suddenly tears coming down her face as God unstopped her ears and healed that woman. People came in with cataracts and they couldn't see and you couldn't even see the color of their eyes and our team prayed over them because there's nothing that we could do for them surgically prayed over them hot tears flowed down their face and when they opened up their eyes the cataracts were gone and they could see 2020 when that happens you kind of got to figure that God did something supernatural that God was in the place it's just amazing what God does. And I think that one of the reasons that he does that is because it doesn't matter if you're a pastor or a physician or a businessman or someone living on a meager income or a millionaire. It doesn't matter what position that you have in society here in the United States. When our team hits the ground in the Dominican Republic, every one of them is a missionary. Paul says it this way in Romans 12, 4, that we are one body but many members and that every member is important. Listen, we choose to let them out of the box when we choose to exercise faith and believe. And when we let them out of the box, we're giving them permission to work in us. There was a, a, a young RN who came to the uh, came with us on the trip, she told me at the end of the week of ministry that, 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 that she was suicidal the week before she came to the Dominican Republic. Tears streaming down her face, she said, before she came to the Dominican Republic, her life had crumbled before her eyes. She had absolutely no hope, no reason to live, but through a veil of tears, she declared that God had done a work in her life that week, and she had recommitted his li her life to him. Then that Sunday on the beach, she was baptized in water. She came back to the United States, a new person knowing that Jesus loved her, that God had given her a purpose and a destiny in him.
You see, when we let him out of the box, we're giving God permission to work through us, and that he did. But we're also giving him permission to transform us. This one woman from First Assembly, Fort Myers, I preach there all the time. It's my home church of about 7,000 people. I'd never met this woman before, and I found out that she had signed up for the trip and that she was legally blind. I'm like, what am I going to do with this lady? And there was a lot of talk about whether or not she should be able to go on the trip or not, who's going to take care of her. But after speaking with her, after hearing her heart's cry to go on a mission trip once in her lifetime so that she could pray for people and believe God to heal them, it was then that the Spirit of God clearly spoke to me and said, take her. And I felt in the midst of a team of 272 people that hope just wasn't our name. It was a verb, that it was time for hope in action. But within the first 24 hours of her being there, she had fallen twice. And I began to question my decision. And the Holy Spirit spoke very clearly to me. Get her a wheelchair. I'm like, a wheelchair? She's not crippled. She's blind. But the Holy Spirit told me to get her a wheelchair. How many of you know good things happen when you listen to the Holy Spirit? It does. So I gave her a wheelchair and I sat her down and this is what I told her. I said, you're going to be transported around the resort to and from our clinics by a wheelchair, and every day you are going to sit in that chair next to a doctor, a nurse, and a translator. And when the medical team got done with their examination and treatment of that patient, then you will have the opportunity to present Christ to them and pray for them from your wheelchair. Let's just say that discussion didn't go well. She gave me so much pushback, and I'm telling you this with her permission, that I was forced to give her a choice of a wheelchair or plane ticket home that day. You see, when you let God out of the box, you need to be willing to go the distance. Because if you don't go the distance, you won't make the difference. We went the distance by letting her go. Now she needed to go the distance by following my directions. You see, friends, it was hard for me to give those directions to to her, but there will be times when the Holy Spirit will require you to do things that are uncomfortable, difficult, seemingly unfair. Be obedient no matter how hard it might seem, and then step back and watch him do miracles before your very eyes. Because when you go the distance, he surprises you. When you go the distance, he empowers you. When you go the distance, he uses you. Several patients, I'm told, were touched by the blind lady's prayers. In fact, Dr. Ronnie and Andrea Davis, our nurse, said she led 13 people to Jesus and experienced six miracles of healing. Can you say praise the Lord? And then, when the Sunday night services were held in 11 different churches, our pastors go out with a translator to all these different churches, she went with one of them, and during that service, God touched her. The woman who had been minimal, had minimal sight before the trip, legally blind, left that service seeing light, colors, and outlines of figures, and her eyesight improved so much that the next day, our reward day, she went to the monkey jungle and ziplined one mile through the monkey jungle. (laughs) How, How does that happen? I've gone through that monkey jungle. It's hard work climbing up those mountains to get up to the top so you can zipline. I mean, it's treacherous. And I, and you're probably thinking, well, pastor, why didn't God just restore her sight totally? I'll tell you why. I don't know. (laughs) But I do know this, that our God is sovereign, and he knows what he's doing. 
One young mom testified that she had a history of severe panic attacks almost daily for several years, so much so that after every panic attack, she would call her pastor's wife and say, I can't go with y'all on the trip. It's just not going to work. I just can't do this. It's just not going to work. She had never been out of the United States before. She had never been on a missions trip before. She suffered from chronic panic attacks, yet somehow she made it on the plane to go on the trip. And at the end of the week, she testified that during the trip, she never personally witnessed a miracle. She never personally witnessed anyone giving their life to Christ, which is crazy. However, on Sunday morning, the morning of our, our, our beach service, two days before returning to the United States, she suddenly realized that she had not had a single panic attack all week. While she served others and didn't see a miracle, God was doing a miracle in her life. She told me she was just hoping to survive, yet she thrived. She let God out of the box. She submitted to his agenda for her. She went the distance, and she experienced the supernatural. And I'm here to tell you today that that was in 2019, and she still hasn't had a panic attack since. Can you say praise the Lord? Isn't that God? Another person lost a job before going to the DR. Somebody paid for her to go on the trip. And, 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 and when she got off the plane seven de days later, she went to the place that she had applied for a new job at, and they said, yes, we've been trying to get a hold of you. We want you. It was a better job than what she had before. Can you say praise the Lord? One guy needed a miracle in his marriage. He came on the trip, but in faith. He said, God told me I had to go. I couldn't stay home. I would have thought, hey, stay home. Get things right with your wife first, man. You need to have your marriage healed. But he said God told him to go on the trip no matter what. He was obedient. He let God out of the box. He went the distance. When he got off the plane seven days later back in the United States, he went home and he called me and he said that God had healed his marriage. Wow, Pastor Kurt. Sounds like you had a team that was really needy or just really messed up. <laughs> yeah. Aren't we all? Sounds like 12 disciples. What a group they were. But look what Jesus did in them and through them. If you only knew, our team let God out of the box. They chose to exercise their faith and belief, and God anointed us to touch a nation. And in the midst of it, he touched us. Wow. He worked in us. He worked through us. And as he did, he transformed us. And he will transform you if you will let him out of the preconceived box of what you think he can and cannot do. Five fishes and two loaves? You can't feed 5,000 people with that. The disciples must have thought that Jesus had done lost his mind because they had Jesus in a box of their own limitations. Don't be too hard on the disciples. We all do it. We put God in the box of our preconceived limitations in the midst of our desperate need of him to bring help and peace and restoration and provision in the midst of our situation. But Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said, but with God, all things are possible. It's either true or it isn't. Our team said, God, we're letting you out of the box. Do whatever you want. Let me say it again. If you want to accomplish the extraordinary, then you must be willing to travel the distance because this race called Christianity is not given to the swift, but to those who can continue to the end. Never before had our team faced the long days that they worked in 2019. Usually eight, nine hour days was a long day for us. But in 2019, we worked 14 hour days. Incredibly unusual. You see, we hand out one ticket per person in every community that we go to a week before we hold the clinic in that community. We only hand out 500 tickets 
because we don't want 2,000 people waiting in line to see a doctor. We can't see that many people in one day. So we limit it to 500 tickets. And that year, we had so many people lined up in line. We saw all the people that had tickets, and there were still 200, 250 people in line. No tickets, but desperately sick and in need of seeing a doctor. So we, our team said, Pastor, we can't go back now. Look at all these people that need help. I said, listen, you let one in, you got to let them all in. And this is going to mean four, could mean five hours more work on site. They said, that's what we came here to do. We saw a thousand more patients that year than we did any other year. Our team worked so hard, they went the distance three hours two to three hours away from where we stayed in Porta Plata to, or Sasua, all the way to Luperon, a very needed area that no missions teams go to because it's so far away. Pastor Rob, my right hand in the Dominican Republic, came to me and he said, Pastor Kurt, he said, we don't have a piece of wire that we need. We must have left it back at the resort to hook the generator into the power grid for the the school that we're at. So I saw a gas station about two miles back. Maybe they have some wire that I can buy. Can I go and check? I said, absolutely go. So he went and he checked and he got there and he said when he got there, he heard some English going on over here. And he looked over and there was a little Toyota pickup truck with eight Americans in the back of the pickup truck. And he said, hey, are you guys from the U.S.? And they said, yes, we're from the United States. And he said, awesome, where are you guys from? And they said, Ohio. And Pastor Rob from Michigan went, oh. <laughs> Even in a third world country, there's still that rivalry between the Wolverines and the Buckeyes. They said, what are you guys doing? We're doing a VBS over here in this community. And they said, what are you guys doing? We've got about 200 doctors, nurses, surgeons, a medical team about two miles this way. Awesome. They prayed for each other, broke, and went their separate ways. That was in the morning. Around noon, I had some, one of my security people came and said, Pastor Kurt, there's a bunch of Americans at the front gate. They want to come in. I said, well, let them in. Let's. So I went over and I talked to them and I found out that they had a, a, a dad brought a, a child. Let's go to that first picture, would you? Go to the first picture. Okay, yeah, keep it on that first picture. Brought this little child, and there's the dad. This little one was totally unresponsive. Dehydrated, pneumonia, a mess. When they put that IV in her arm, she didn't even wince. You know that the little one's in rough shape when that happens. And they brought that baby, and I said, yeah, bring him in. So we took care of her, pumped all kinds of stuff. I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but they just dumped all kinds of... Uh, I, can't even, I can't even remember what the medicine was, but in, into her and... In, in, and my pediatrician said, we need to call the prayer team in here because she may not make it. And I'm like, not making it isn't an option. We've got to pray this kid through. So the prayer team came in, laid hands on, on her, and began to pray for her. Look at this. Is, the, is this the second picture? Yeah. Okay, so this is the second picture. Her eyes are rolled back in her head. She's still not responding. About three hours later, I hear a whole bunch of commotion coming from the room where they were praying for her, and this is what I walked in and I found. <laughs> you see, when traveling the distance, why stop, friends, short? Why stop short when the promise is right before you? You know, Hebrews 10, 6 says this, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. You know what? You may be hearing this word this morning, and maybe you've let God out of the box. Maybe you're at home watching this on live stream, 
and you've gone the distance. And now you're prayerfully waiting for him to answer. Let me remind you in closing that it took 21 days for the answer to get back to Daniel. 21 days. I hear believers telling me, you know, I've prayed and I've prayed and God's just not listening. Uh Uh-uh. Not true. God hears every cry of every one of his children. And he answers them. If you look at Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 through 15, you'll find out. Let me read from verse 10. It says, then suddenly a hand touched me. This is Daniel. Which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Yeah, I'd be trembling too if an angel came to me, amen? Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. From the first prayer, Daniel's words were heard. And the angel goes on to say, And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, Satan, withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen. Isn't that awesome? 21 days, Daniel waited. You say, but Pastor Kurt, I've been waiting 21 years for my spouse to be saved. I've been waiting 21 years for my child to come to Christ. I've been praying and believing. And all I can tell you is Don't stop short of the promise. Go the distance. God is always faithful. He is always faithful. Daniel didn't give up. He went the distance, and the answer came. What do you call the distance between a dream and reality? Discipline. It takes discipline to pray and believe and not give up. It takes real discipline to let God out of the box and go the distance. And those who live undisciplined lives rarely see the dream become a reality. We box God in when we have a preconceived idea of what he's going to do, when we ought to have a hopeful expectation of the promise. My daughter, Amber, is a Lee County deputy in Fort Myers, Florida. Her husband is a Lee County deputy in Fort Myers, Florida. My son was a deputy in Warrington, Virginia. Both of my kids I sent to Bible college and they became cops. (laughs) I'm very proud of them. My grandson was only two and a half years old when his daddy died in his sleep. My my daughter's uh, husband in Fort Myers, Florida. They live about a mile from us. Shortly after that, my daughter, a jailer, passed out behind the bars on the wrong side of the bars where the prisoners were. And she had always treated her prisoners with respect. And so when she went down, those that saw her go down formed a circle around her and protected her from the other inmates until help arrived and got her to the hospital, ran her through a bunch of tests, found out that she when she was, uh, her heart was developing, that it didn't all turn into, me- 
and to muscle, part of it stayed spongy. I don't know what the condition is, but that's why she passed out. So they put her on medicine for that. And here she is, a single mom. She's got a problem with her heart. She's got a three-year-old. Nobody else to turn to, and mom and dad are traveling across the country preaching the gospel and out of the, na- out of the country often. Then she had problems with her thyroid, and they gave her medicine for that, and the cardiologist sat down and said, those two medicines don't play well with each other. And I want you to understand how serious this is. I had a 21-year-old last year with the same condition, and I was only able to treat her for four months, and she died. That's when you sit down with your grandson and teach him how to use the phone. If mama doesn't wake up, you dial 911. And here's the speed dial for Poppy and Gammy. Every day I pray for my daughter, Amber. She's 43 years old. She's still dealing with that condition. My grandson's 11 years old now. Pastor, you've been pastoring long enough to know that when the phone rings in the middle of the night, it's never a praise report. It's always difficult news. So I go to bed every night with my phone right next to me. It's on. And I set that phone down, and my prayer is, God, don't let it ring tonight. Because I know what that'll mean. Why am I telling you this story? It's because I'm still praying. Because I have to be disciplined, and I have to let God out of the box. And I have to have faith and I have to believe and I have to go the distance and I have to keep praying because either the Bible is true or it's not. And the scripture says that he hears the cries of his children and he answers them. So this is not about Hope International today. It's about where you are and what you're going through. It's about what you've been praying for and believing God for all of these years, but yet you haven't seen it happen yet. And you're wondering, God, have you heard my prayers? God, are you ever going to move upon this? I can tell you the truth, friends, that if you let God out of the preconceived box of what you think he can or cannot do if you'll go the distance and if you don't give up and keep praying the answer will come and for my daughter my amber the answer's going to come i believe that so let me ask you have you believe, been believing god for a miracle in your life A prayer that hasn't been answered. Maybe it's been months. Maybe it's been weeks. Maybe it's been years. But you've been believing God and it hasn't happened yet. Don't give up. Don't give up.